Welcome to the last in a series on writing in plain legal English. Today I want to conclude by talking about a number of final guiding principles uh, when we think about writing in plain legal English. And the guiding principles I want to speak about today are the idea of creating ample white space in a document. So when you look at a document, a document that is easy to read, has generous margins, space between paragraphs, and the paragraphs themselves aren't too long. If you're trying to create a document that can be read by busy people, that ample white space is very helpful. Even if you're writing a conventional law essay, shorter paragraphs will tend to be better and easier to digest than long paragraphs that run over several pages. So create ample white space. Also, don't be afraid to make some use of bullet points, lists, and tables. When you're dealing with a lot of information or a lot of complex information, sometimes it's better to break it down into smaller chunks rather than leaving it in a large, undigested mass of prose. And the last point I want to make about learning to be a better writer is that it's very useful to embrace constructive criticism. That is, get feedback on your work and listen to it seriously. And we'll go through each of those in turn. So first, let's consider how we create ample white space. So again, my central tip here is simply, can you break it up? If you look at your first draft and it's just a mass of text, how can you break that up in a way that's easier to read? So once again, I'll give an example from my own practice. Here's something that could be uh, a paragraph straight from a report that I've written on uh, the law of piracy. So I'm talking about the law of piracy, I'm talking about the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and the paragraph reads, it is important to note that the Article 101 unclos definition of piracy also includes pi as piracy any act of voluntary participation in the operation of a ship or an aircraft with knowledge of the facts making it a pirate ship or aircraft. Article 101b of the Law of the Sea Convention. Crucially, pirate ship is defined under Article 103 as being either a ship intended by the persons in dominant control to be used for the purpose of committing a pirate act, or a ship which has been used to commit any such act, so long as it remains under the control of the persons guilty of that act. The effect is that states have jurisdiction over an offence of participation in a vessel intended for use in future piracy attacks or cruising with pirate intent. This is analogous to nas the national law offence of going prepared to commit burglary. Article 101c also extends universal jurisdiction to cover any act of inciting or of intentionally facilitating piracy. Article 101c. So that's quite dense prose. I've uh, included an awful lot of legal information on several topics. And it's not particularly interesting or particularly easy to read in that format. So how do I add more white space? Break it up. So here I've taken that one paragraph, I've broken it into three, and I've used two bullet points with a dash. So my first paragraph, it's important to note that the definition of piracy includes other things. And then I have this point. Crucially, pirate ship is defined as being either, and because I've got two alternatives, I've used bullet points. A ship defined in one way, or a ship defined in another way. So I've framed my idea, I've pointed out the critical two alternatives, and then I've bullet pointed those two alternatives. And I have white space around those bullet points. The effect is that states have jurisdiction. So I'm summarizing then in uh, the next paragraph the effect of what I've already said. Then finally, I'm making a separate point at the bottom about Article 101C. So the guiding principle here is, if it's a new idea, you can start a new paragraph. So the first thing I'm doing is outlining a definition. Then I've used bullet points to signal two alternatives in that definition. I have a new paragraph. Well, I have to to some extent because it follows the bullet points, but that summarizes the effect of that definition. And then when I'm pointing out a completely separate part of the definition, a part of the definition that deals with a totally different topic, I've started a new paragraph. So new idea, new paragraph. All right, let's carry on with the idea of using bullet points. So again, 
here's another um, example from a piece of my own writing where I have an awful lot of information in a list format. And we know it's a list because at the end of the second line of this paragraph, on the right of the screen, there's a colon. And then if we go through all the information, there are semicolons. So I'm carving out items in a, lift, in a list. And I begin the UNSG report, so in this case the UN Secretary General's report, outlines seven options for prosecuting Somali pirates, several of which are variants on a theme. So I'm signalling here that I'm going to group the options. And then I lay them out. Prosecution before a national court or other courts in the region, with a certain amount of detail, and that covers options 1, 3, and 4. Prosecutions before a special court of Somalia, sitting extraterritorially in another state in the region, option 2. Establishing a regional court based on a treaty with UN assistance, option 5. Establishing a hybrid court in a national system based on a treaty with the UN, option 6. And establishing an international tribunal through a Security Council resolution under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, option 7. Now, I am breaking probably any number of my rules from previous screencasts. This is an incredibly long sentence, and it includes far too much information. But it is all logically related. I've said there are seven options. I've even tried to amalgamate options one, three, and four. I've tried to simplify the explanation, but it's still a paragraph length sentence. It's far too much. So the obvious way of dealing with this is simply to use bullet points. The UN Secretary General's report outlines seven options for prosecuting Somali pirates, several of which are variants on a theme. Prosecution before national courts or courts in the region, prosecution before a special court of Somalia, establishing a regional court, establishing a hybrid court, and establishing an international tribunal. So, in a sense, this is just cheating. I've taken something that was a dreadfully long, hard to follow, sentence, and by breaking it up and actually creating more white space with the bullet points, I've made it easier to read and easier to concentrate. So when you're listing information, it's often very good to use bullet points. As with anything, you can overuse them. So if every single page of your essay or document is simply another shopping list of bullet points, that's going to become tedious. But when you do have a number of options to lay out, or a lot of information to convey in a short time, bullet points can be very useful. Um, a related option, obviously, is using lists. And again, really, this is just bullet points again, but simply numbering the points. So here's yet another piracy-based example. The basic definition of piracy requires an illegal act of violence, detention or depredation on the high seas committed for private ends by a private vessel against another vessel. That's just a quote from the UN Law of the Sea Convention. But as lawyers, we don't like to try and apply all of those ideas at the same time. So it's again easier if we break it up. So here I've just given the same information in a list format. The basic definition of piracy requires 1. An illegal act of violence, detention or depredation. 2. Occurring on the high seas. 3. Committed for private ends. 4. By a private vessel against another vessel. Now the advantage of the numbered list here is if I'm then going on to explain each of these elements in the definition, I can use those same numbers potentially as headings, or I can say things like uh, in relation to element 1, we need to distinguish between violence, detention, and depredation. So lists, uh, in the same way as bullet points, can help break up complex ideas and make them more manageable. And the advantage of the numbered list is that you can then refer to the numbered elements later in your writing. The other possibility that I raised was using tables to convey complex information. So, for example, when I teach state immunity. It's a complex area, the immunity of foreign states before national courts, and one can think about the case law as being, as covering both civil and criminal cases, and there are two different types of immunity. There's immunity attaching to sovereign functions, so acts that are of a government character, and there's so-called immunity ratione personae, or immunity that attaches to people who hold particular offices, like uh, the head of state or 
the Minister of Foreign Affairs or certain other uh, ministerial posts. So one way of simplifying a confusing mass of case law, if you're attempting to write about a number of different state immunity cases, is perhaps to present information, as I've done here in a table. So if I want to explain why the reasoning in Pinochet number 3 might be different from uh, the reasoning in al Sani and the UK, where Mr. al Sani attempt to, attempted to sue the government and sheikh of Kuwait in a civil claim for torture, one of the distinctions might be that one's a civil case and the other's a criminal case, and it's also a relevant distinction that the cases were dealing with different types of immunity. So that's an example of uh, trying to simplify complex legal concepts by reducing them to a table, and the same technique can be used, obviously, in other areas. All right, one of the last points I wanted to make in this series was the need to embrace constructive criticism. This can sometimes be difficult. Students and even experienced writers often feel very vulnerable when they put up a document for comment. And, for example, if you leave law school and go into commercial practice, you're likely to draft a document, pass it to a partner in the law firm for comment, and it will simply come back bleeding with red ink. There won't be a lot of obvious praise on the document. And this is simply a basic point to make. Lawyers, and also academics, tend to circle what's wrong. They don't tick what's right. So actually, if a third of your document is covered in red ink in feedback, well, actually that means that your reader thought that 70% of it was perfectly fine. So, as it were, when dealing with critical readers, particularly in a business context and sometimes an academic context, you have to be aware of the negative compliment. That is, when people haven't criticised an element of your work, they think it's fine, but they may not always say so. The other point to make is if you're doing anything that's substantial, a piece of writing of any length, it's best to get feedback early and often. Now, as a student, this might not always be from a member of faculty. They may not be able, or certainly won't have the time, to look at multiple drafts of the one document, if the examination rules even allow them to look at drafts, and universities will vary on that. But that doesn't mean that you can't show a document to your friends. Also, you don't have to have written that much to start getting feedback. A very useful exercise is often to try and prepare your document, your essay, your piece of research. Prepare a plan for it on one piece of paper in the form of headings and bullet points. What do you think the major topics that you'll have to discuss are, and what do you think the main points will be under each? You can then show that essay plan either to an academic or to someone at your law firm or to a student colleague and say, what do you think about this? Does this argument make sense? Simply trying to explain what you want to write to someone else will often highlight to you changes that you need to make. Sometimes it's only when we talk to someone else about something we're writing that we realise where the gaps are. Even discussing a plan with someone can be useful. And so in that sense, it's very good to discuss your ideas ahead of time. And if you're attempting to write either in an academic or business context, it might be worth considering the Mumford method. Uh, this is a method devised by an academic, Stephen Mumford. I've got the web address of his site uh, at the bottom of the screen. But his essential idea is never just start writing. Talk about the ideas with someone else first. See what their thoughts are. See what their, in particular, their objections are. Then come up with an outline and then try and give a presentation to a wider audience. Now this will work better for academics and in a business context perhaps than for students. Then when you get the feedback, uh, both positive and negative, on that plan, you then have a lot of information about the kind of things that you will need to cover in the document you eventually write, the objections you will need to meet, 
and also ideas you'll want to incorporate that you would not have come up with otherwise, um, except by getting comments on an early draft. Then when it comes time to write the document, actually you have a developed plan, you have a lot of information, and you know the arguments that you'll have to counter. And so that's a particularly constructive way of thinking um, about writing, but it'll only work for longer projects. And a student writing essays won't always have time to do that, but there's still a lot of sense in doing the other things we've discussed here. Talking about your ideas ahead of time with another student, and to the, if you possibly can finish a draft early, get feedback from someone, anyone, another student on your course, a parent, an academic, whoever. But someone will be able to then um, point out to you, hey, this doesn't appear to move logically from this paragraph to that paragraph, or haven't you overlooked a certain important idea? So constructive criticism isn't something you should only be looking for at the end of having drafted a document and gotten feedback, whether that be a mark from an academic or comments from a law firm partner. It should be a more continual process. And particularly uh, in a business or academic context, you can expect to draft the same document several times, probably many more times than you would draft an essay as a student. Right, so the guiding principles we've discussed in this screencast are the idea that you should create ample white space to make a document readable, and the idea that shorter paragraphs are better, they're easier to read and easier to absorb. I've also suggested that you shouldn't be afraid to make some use of bullet points, lists and tables. Don't let the entire document become bullet points, lists and tables, but do use them to convey complex information uh, or situations where you have a lot of options to cover, or where a legal concept, for example, has a lot of different elements that need explaining. And embrace constructive criticism, including through seeking feedback early and often. And as always, these principles are a guide. They're not inflexible rules. You have to tailor them to your own experience. Take from them what you find useful. And that's the end of this series of screencasts on writing in plain legal English. Thank you for listening, and I do hope you found them useful.